Hello and welcome to the Lifting the Iceberg podcast. My name is Tyler James Berger and today I sit down with James Sharkot. James is an expert on the intersection between water, well-being, and consciousness and is the co-founder of Be Life Water. James really blew my mind on this podcast. I was so completely unaware of how much I didn't know about water and how much of the quality of the water that we drink can affect our lives. So without any further ado, please welcome James Sharkhunt. James, thanks for being here. I'm really interested in talking to you and, and just picking your brain about water and all the things about water that people generally don't think about. We think of water as clean or unclean, drinkable or undrinkable, um, filtered or unfiltered. You know, sometimes people just put water through a Brita and they think it makes all the difference. But something that I've noticed on Brita's and and Pure's and other kind of um, low-end water filters like that is they don't advertise that it actually makes the water cleaner. They just advertise that it makes it taste better. Mm -hmm. And that's something I've seen in in the water industry a lot is there's a big focus on taste. But, you know, looking more into you, I've learned that there's a whole new dimension of water that I was never really, I never really knew anything about. And something you know a lot about is structured water. So I guess my first question is, where did your journey with water start? And specifically, like, what is structured water? Mm. So my journey with water started at birth, I suppose, because we're all in a womb swimming in water for our first nine months. So we all share that in common in our human experience. Uh, After that, I was born in Niagara Falls, New York. So right near a very powerful, fast-moving, energetic water place. And my journey and my adult life started with me being very focused on diet at first. Like most of us, when we are considering health and well-being, we consider the food that we eat and what we put in our bodies without even taking a look at we are 75% water by volume. and By molecule count, we're 99.99% water molecules. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to adjust my diet and try to become a healthier person and being very careful at what I put in my body when I came across this Instagram post that said, your body's 75% water. And it just struck me like a bolt of lightning, you know, this epiphany pop that if I'm 75% water, why am I focusing so much on this 25%? You know, there's something that's at least three times greater (laughs) an effect in making up my physical being. uh, And that's the water. So it started me down a journey for the past three or so years, taking a look at what is the water in our body? What is the physical component? What is the bioelectric component? What is the structure of the water molecule, the way that our body uses it, the way nature forms it? And that's kind of been a journey for me for the past three years and it become a passion. Mm. And what led you into discovering that the structure of water itself mattered? Uh, The first thing that I discovered was I went, like most people, when they get into water, is exploring different filtration systems Mm -hmm. and being concerned, what's in my water? Is it filtered or unfiltered, clean or not clean? Mm -hmm. That that whole discussion that you mentioned. And so I went through a variety. And uh, like yourself, I had purchased myself a reverse osmosis water filter, thinking that water without anything in it is clean and pure and that's the way it should be. And then a friend of mine uh, dropped off a water structuring device, so this piece of water technology. And I had use of it for one week, and I poured all my water through it. And at the end of the week, I was feeling much better, much more energized. I was sleeping less, but feeling more energy. And at the end of the week, and when my friend took this device hmm. back, the structured water device, I noticed immediately when I went to go drink any other type of water, my body was just rejecting it. I tasted awful to me, even though it tasted normal. Uh, my body was very much not in alignment with that type of water. So I knew that there was a lot to it, and that led me down a path of research and mm-hmm. uh, now speaking about water as well. Yeah. So, I mean, so I guess structured water is, yeah, not what's in it, but 
the vibration of it, I guess you could say, or um... sure. Um, structured water has, goes by many names. Um, Dr. Gerald Pollack out of the University of Washington is probably the most famous now for calling it exclusion zone water. And exclusion zone water being the gelatinous water that we find in fruits and all our vegetables. Mm. Um, there's a layer of water that's surrounding every single cell that, of anything that's alive. So every human cell and every bacteria cell is surrounded by a layer of water and, and, and inside of the cell as well. So the plasma water, uh, the water in our blood, the water that's surrounding our brain is all of one type of consistency. Mm. And so uh, it has to do with the geometric angle or the hydrogen bond angle of the two hydrogens to the one oxygen. Mm. So H2O, two hydrogens one bonded uh, to one oxygen, essential oxygen. Mm. But those bond, the, the angle between the bonds of the hydrogen to the oxygen can vary greatly. So it can be mm. anywhere from two at degrees. At the molecular level, at, the bonds can differ in shape. Exactly. Wow. Interesting. And so th if we think of a water molecule as a building block or mm -hmm. a, you know, a Lego, if you will, the Lego can come in many different shapes. And so it's all still chemically identical, H2O, but when we try to start building things out of the water, it becomes very different because the shape of the angle of those hydrogens bonded mm. to the oxygen can vary greatly, 180 degrees to 2 degrees, if you will. What, what dictates or governs the, the shape of water? Yeah, the shape of water, great movie. <laughs> now, the, the shape of water is determined uh, by whatever it's being exposed to. So water is the mother and medium or uh, a malleable supercomputer, if you will. Uh, that's what Professor Rustin Roy out of the University of Pennsylvania calls it, the, mm. the most malleable supercomputer. Hmm. And it's because what water does is it alters its hydrogen bond angle depending on what vibrational frequencies it's being exposed to. So if that's uh, the glass of that's holding your liquid when you're drinking water, then it's going to pick up a specific angle off of that. Hmm. If you're playing music to it or if you're talking to the water, it'll mm -hmm. pick up something off that. If, it is, if the water is being exposed to dirt or fluoride or chlorine or sediment or uh, music or mm -hmm. thoughts or going against gravity or it's been hit by a 90 degree gust of wind in the upper atmosphere before it falls as rain or hmm. as it rolls over this shape of rock all of these things mm -hmm. are influencing the water molecule that it's being exposed to altering its hydrogen bond angle wow. and the structure of water and so why this is important is because when you get a whole lot of water molecules, mole water molecules being very small, it's just two hydrogens and one oxygen, so it's a very small molecule in terms of molecule size. And so when you get a whole bunch of them together, it carries an electric charge. So uh, water is a dipolar uh, molecule, meaning that has a positive side or a negative side or a male side, female side. There's a polarity there. Hmm. And so when you get a bunch of them lined up, it starts making shapes. And those shapes, based on the electric charge, are what are the building blocks of life. And the, the electric charge, whenever it starts lining up with multiple water molecules, also creates flow or current. So what we, what, how we measure electricity. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, I mean, something that I think about when I'm introduced to this idea is my journey, particularly over the past year with water. Um, I moved to New York City on New Year's Eve 2018. And uh, I just drank the tap water when I started living here because where I come from, the tap water is fantastic. You know, um, my house is probably less than a mile away from the filtration plant, uh, Marsville filtration plant, where um, they don't put any fluoride in the water. Uh, my mom actually had uh, a bit of a part in bringing up a protest against putting fluoride in the water uh, in, in Morrisville in Pennsylvania. Um, that's excellent. And because the need to put fluoride in water, that, that's a whole other subject that we can get to. And, you know, fluoride is the, the reasons we're sold as to why there should be fluoride in the water is so bogus. But going back, when I was growing up, I always had good water in my house. I just always like felt good about the water that I had. I knew it was clean. I knew we had a good filtration plant. Um, it was coming in from the Delaware River, which I, I lived right next to. Um, and I feel like I, I had a deep connection with my water because I was living 
like a stone's throw away from the river from which it was pulled. But in New York City, when I'm living in Harlem, I, I, started, I just started drinking the tap water and I asked people about it, like, how is New York City tap water? And everyone goes, oh, it's, it's actually really good. New York City tap water comparably to like other places in the country. And I even had like I've talked to some a, a few health experts just that I've met who I've brought up the question, how is New York City tap water? And they say that it's good water. But then I think, OK, it could be good tap water as it leaves the plant. But then I think about the miles of pipes that this water travels through before it comes out of my faucet. And when I think about noises and vibrations being picked up and carried by water, when I drink water that comes out of my faucet in Harlem, I'm drinking water that has pretty much picked up the vibration of New York City. You know, and I love New York, but I don't know if I want its vibration in my water. And it sounds... It sounds very woo-woo. You know, it sounds like, oh, you're, you're worried about the vibration of your water. It just kind of, uh, a lot of people would look at that as just some kind of like hippie nonsense. But as you just explained, like the, in the environment that water travels in matters in terms of its structure. And I've also noticed in my past, there's a place, uh, again, in my hometown, Bucks County, in a place called Smithtown, there's Smithtown Creek, and there's a small little well house next to the creek that just has a pipe sticking out of it, and it has well water like coming out just constantly, 365 days a year, just like water flowing out of this well, and you can just put your water bottle underneath of it and drink it. And that, for me, w was always the best water that I've ever had in my life. Um, because it's it's right next to this beautiful stream in pristine Pennsylvania wilderness, and it tastes so amazing, and it makes me feel so good. You know, there was one time where I was staying close by to this area, and I drank nothing but this water for seven days, and I felt a vitality that I feel like I can contribute to that water. You know, like water in its natural state, water that was kind of flowing over rocks, as you said, and and the only sounds were birds chirping and the only sounds that could have been positively or negatively affecting it were sounds found in nature, which I think probably are intrinsically positive. So what what do you think about how New York City could be affecting the vibration of the tap water here. Yeah, I think you and the billions of other New York residents feel it, whether they recognize it or not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. And as you mentioned, yeah, by the time it gets to where you're drinking it, it's been absorbing so much. Um, from the pump house through the hundreds of years old piping mm -hmm. that is still lead contained pipes in New York City that have not been replaced in hundreds of years. The infrastructure here is very old. At uh, least pre war, like from my research, like if something was built before like 1940 to 1945, then there's a high probability that there is lead and that there is, you know, just structural damages that. Are, are coming out through the water absolutely yeah and it is miles of piping and so one of the things you have to consider is water in its natural state when we take a look at these creeks and these rivers are any of them ever flowing in a straight line mm -hmm. rivers no. always have bends and twists and flow and they're always having an opportunity to go to the surface and dive back down and exchange information and molecules with the air so this is very important so when you have a uh, as in New York City and most municipalities where you have a closed system, that is, it, they're taking the water from the river, they're putting it through high pressure and filtration, it, filtration they're exposing it to uh, UV light. UV light is what kills all the bacteria, but it also kills all the life. Mm -hmm. And UV light is just a killer of all life. So it's being exposed to that. Then it's coming through in a closed pipe where it has no chance to have any air. Mm -hmm. And as you know, if you have seal... 
some water and let it sit for a long time with no air exchange, it starts going moldy and starts growing mm -hmm. algae and uh, starts becoming very unnatural and unsafe. Yeah. So that's what's happening momentarily uh, as it's being pumped into the pipes. Then it's coming mm -hmm. through in straight lines, um, which, as I just mentioned, is not how nature does it at all. Yeah. And it's going through 90 degree angles. And once again, you never find 90 degree angles in nature. Nature is always mm -hmm. round and bends and curves. Mm -hmm. Then what floor do you live on in, in Harlem? I live on the third floor. I live on the third, third floor, floor. Walk up. Have you ever seen water climb three floors in mm. nature? I have not. Water does I mean, not do that. I've seen Old Faithful, the Yellowstone Na National Park. There you I go. mean, that water goes pretty high. Yeah. But that's also, you know, high sulfur content. Sure. <laughs> yeah, but the point being is that water, in order to climb gravity, needs to be under pressure. Mm. So it's all this back pressure that's constantly being pushed and forced. It's like the water is under stress. It's under stress all the time. Yeah, and it's going through its unnatural <sighs> courseways uh, that are killing the life-giving properties of the water. Yeah. And as we know, water, everyone, the expression... Water is life is very well known and well spoken, mm -hmm. but you know my question is always, well, what is it that gives water its life giving capacity? Yeah. Now, what it, what is known about the the structure of water and its effects on well being? You know, like I can say that I think I felt differently after a week of drinking pristine groundwater. But I don't actually know if there's any evidence to that. I don't know why I would feel better. Like, what could these, what could the structure of water have to do with your well being? It has everything to do with it. Um, I would say it's the largest contributing factor. How? At, at, after, after your emotional state. Yeah. And so much of your emotional state is often due to the water that you drink, too, because, um, the structure of the water, uh, the shape of the water is influences so many things from how the DNA is replicating mm -hmm. to how, whether or not there's information loss at the telomere ends when uh, DNA is replicating. Uh, the way you form memories in, on your neurons in your brain is directly in direct relation to the structure of the water molecule. So the shape of the water mm -hmm. molecules dictate how the memory is being formed on the neural network. Which is a pretty... Just because the water itself is affecting the neuron exactly yeah mm. so it builds these little sh the interior shape of the water uh, dictates what these little ufo shaped looking things that that are made out of uh, different proteins and how they're they're formed and then whenever that binds to a neuron site that implants that neuron site with a memory and so the the thing that is responsible for creation of the memory is the shape of the water molecule or the structure of the water molecule and so Ultimately, our body inside the cell, in the plasma, outside of the cell, in that exclusion zone, uh, in our blood and in our brain, all of this is always at this around 104 degree angle, uh, hydrogen bond angle. So whenever you're giving your body water that is not in this ideal structure, mm. your body has to therefore take energy and process it and put it into the format that it can then use in the body mm. before it can even use it. So it's similar. And that takes energy. It takes energy. So it's the difference between eating a piece of fruit or drinking fruit juice mm -hmm. or trying to chew down all that kale or putting it into a kale smoothie. Mm -hmm. You're having something else, in this case, nature, or sometimes mm -hmm. it's technology, or sometimes it's all the, the various ways that we can structure our water. It's doing that processing for you and putting into its immediate biological state. So the net result is you have a, a huge amount of energy left over to do other functions. Mm -hmm. Because like your body is right, exactly. Because your body is sort of like a, a similar to a secretary mm -hmm. that's answering phone calls all the time. The liver calls up, "Hey, I need a repair." Your stomach calls up, "Hey, I need to process this food." Your brain calls up and says, hey, I need to con conduct this electric signal to move my foot out of the fire. Mm -hmm. And so all of this takes energy. Or talk energy. on the podcast. Or talk on the podcast. <laughs> so your body's constantly filing all of these requirements and then having to prioritize them. So whenever you're not having an adequate hydration or water of the sufficient uh, variety that is properly structured of the right energy state and that isn't immediately available to your cells, then there's a lot of functions that your body is therefore subduing and doesn't have a chance or the energy to get to mm. doing. Now, is all water in nature clo more close to this ideal structure? You know, like what is the difference between river water and groundwater and rainwater? You know, people have been drinking 
uh, water from all sources for since the beginning of time right you know and and when water comes out of nature is it in its most ideal form not all the time unfortunately what, what's the most ideal situation for uh for drinking water the most yeah. ideal situation that I've found is when it's coming at off, off a high mountain. Mm, so mountain water. Mountain water. So whenever you have... Like glacial water? Glacial water is great, too. So glacial melt water. There's mm-hmm. um, a community of people living up in Pakistan, up in northern Pakistan. And their average life expectancy is 111 years in their, in their community. And the only thing they're drinking is glacial melt water off the mountain. Wow. And so whenever water goes through a phase change so in this case from ice back into liquid it's always forming in this hexagonal 104 degree structured hydrogen Mm -hmm. bond way which is the same way that if you take a look at a snowflake when rain falls um, Mm -hmm. every single snowflake is in this hexagon pattern has a six-sided symmetry basis genesis point that it then Mm -hmm. builds crystals off of Mm -hmm. and as we know you can have in one snowfall, every single snowflake is shaped differently. So why is every single snowflake shaped differently? And that is because it's being exposed to a different variables than any other snowflake. So it was made at a different time, at a different altitude, getting exposed to different wind patterns or the different amount of dissolved solids in the air. And so all of these things affect the unique shape of every single water molecule or cluster Mm -hmm. that we call snowflake. And that's even out of one very, very uh, uh, localized region, you Mm -hmm. know, or one cloud even, and you have such variety. So what, I think your question was, what was the difference between rainwater and groundwater Mm -hmm. and these things? It's all going to be very different because every little detail and every single minute experience that the water goes through affects the the shape and the structure of the water. Mm -hmm. Now, there are a lot of very fancy bottled water companies, and I've always looked at that as just like how many marketing gimmicks can be created to sell water in a bottle, which I'm probably a lot of it is, but then you see... um, you know, bottled volcanic water or um, water from uh, like Icelandic glaciers um, or, you know, I think the one you mentioned was in Pakistan. If a company were to bottle up this this glacial mountain water, would it survive the bottling and, and transportation process? Like how, how resilient is the structure of, of the water once it's already put into that form? So it has to do with the energetics of the water at the time that it was bottled. Mm. And then also what other factors it's been exposed to. During the shipping. Yeah. So if you were to take that Pakistan volcanic water and you were to keep it in a clear plastic bottle and leave it outside for a day and let it soak up all those UV rays from the sun, it would be completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. So the bottling methods, um, how much they're able to get the electromagnetic frequency. So has it been exposed to cell phones? Has it been exposed to Wi-Fi signals? Has Mm -hmm. it been hit by satellite? Has, was it was it in a truck ride where the truck driver was just really angry and yelling at you know his his friends or his family, yeah. and then it's getting picked up by the emotionality of the truck of the truck driver. So um, then there are ways to mitigate the exposure to that, but com- bottled water companies are not doing that. And yeah. as you mentioned, it is just a marketing scheme to get us to spend around sixty billion dollars a year uh, on bottled water. Yeah, uh, thirty billion in the U.S. alone. Yeah, and yeah, I there's a lot, just a lot of alarming statistics going yeah. on with the bottled water industry to ultimately provide a product that is not hydrating and not healthy for us or the planet. Yeah, or or for the communities where this water is being sourced. Exactly. You know, I know Fiji water. It's 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 kind of become a banana republic in Fiji where they're the biggest company is Fiji Water. Right. And it's pretty much a company that owns the labor of the entire area because there are no other businesses that can really compete. Right. And all all economy in Fiji just kind of like trickles down from that corporate monopoly. What's the environmental damage that happens uh, when these companies come in and just suck all the water out of the ground? Oh, it's huge because you're violating the water rights of mm-hmm. the people who live there. Um, you're completely changing the the local socioeconomic uh, kind of situation that's going on. 
by altering the jobs, how people can get money and make money in those areas. Mm -hmm. You're changing the level of groundwater. So what we're finding is that the vegetation in these areas are starting to dry up. They're becoming more salty. Uh, less plants can grow. That's affecting agriculture. That's affecting the wildlife situation. And there's only a set amount of water that's been on this earth since the earth was created. Mm -hmm. You know, water doesn't get created or destroyed because it is, like anything else, energy. Mm -hmm. And um, so the more we push water and move it around to places where it doesn't exist, mm -hmm. then the more chaos we see on the planet. Yeah. Um, what, are, what are your opinions on desalination? Uh, I think desalination has a lot of potential, mm -hmm. but the methodologies in which we're doing it are really only sufficient for seafaring vessels. Mm -hmm. um, I was not like, not to bring water from the ocean on far onto land uh, in any kind of functional way. Yeah, because just the amount of energy that's going into all the desalination current methodologies that are mm -hmm. being employed is not productive it's not a good energy exchange mm -hmm. um, so down in southern california they've been putting up desalination plants that cost 10 million dollars plus with operating costs in the millions for each year to to produce and it's still less than two percent of the total water production for those areas hmm. so it's a massive energy undertaking with very little results yeah. So it's fine if you're on a sub a submarine or, you know, some type of, you know, you're out sailing yeah. across the sea and you need to source water from the ocean. That's fine but for, not, for small scales. But not as an alternative to sustainably using um, fresh water on land. I would say so. Yeah, there's there's so many different ways to capture water uh, that are way more effective than desalination. Mm -hmm. Even rainwater. Yeah, collection. even rainwater or collecting the humidity in the air and then mm -hmm. using a condensing coil to, to store it in bins or using uh, mm -hmm. passive kind of billboard style um, screens that catch the moisture in the air. So there's a lot can, a lot can be done with just capturing humidity mm -hmm. because even in places with low humidity, 20% humidity like you'll find in the desert, that's still 20% of the air that is water. Mm-hmm. Which is a significant amount of water, yeah. considering the volume of air. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, what are the best methods that people can use to make sure that their tap water can be structured in the most optimal way? Like, you know, if someone's only source of water, uh, other than buying bottled water, is the water that is coming out of their sink, what can they do to that water to optimize it? They have to structure it in some way, and there's a variety of ways of doing it. Mm. Um, I notice you have crystals in your water bottle. I do have crystals in my water bottle. That's a great way to do it. So using uh, crystals or gems or um, any type of earth material, you can go collect rocks out of the local stream, mm. and then you can use those and keep those in your water because uh, water is always picking up the vibration. Everything is vibration. You can measure it. Mm -hmm. It's not some hippie term. Yeah. But, you know, it's just, everything is, is, is vibration, and Einstein proved that with his... Famous e equals mc squared, mm -hmm. um, that everything is energy and therefore vibration and can be measured and, mm -hmm. uh, and everything has its unique signature. So mm -hmm. even just picking up local um, stones that you'll find in a riverbed uh, will ultimately provide that mineralization information mm -hmm. to the water and pass that on. Um, there's a lot of ways, if, if you want me to kind of cover well, I want all, to talk all the a little structured bit more ways. about crystals okay. because, you know, crystals have a structure yes and the structure seems permanent you know it seems like crystals are very rigid you mm -hmm. know and you're not going to see an amethyst crystal turn into quartz anytime soon you know i feel like crystals once they've become crystallized in that state uh they maintain that state so where water no pun intended is very fluid right <laughs> in its in its ability to change its structure um so what are the differences in you said you can just kind of pick up a uh, a stone from from a stream or or any kind of earth rocks as they have picked up the vibration of the environment but what what crystals I see your water bottle you have multiple types of crystals in there yes what what particular types of crystals are the best for pairing with water and why does, I think that's does it rather, matter? I think that's rather subjective because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. everybody's different and everybody needs a different nutrition profile and therefore different information. Uh, so it's really, I would say, it's kind of subjective based on the user experience. 
Me personally, it's diamonds, rubies, emeralds, the super high pressure Diamonds stones. in your water, damn. Yeah. I, yeah <laughs> Balling. So, yeah, so I have I have a vial of diamonds that I keep in my water bottle or my water vessel at home. It's an egg-shaped water vessel, and it has a diamond vial uh, sitting in there. Just because the more um, compact the crystalline information, uh, the better the delivery. And mm-hmm. so water is a liquid crystalline matrix. Mm-hmm. Um, we are just giant sacks of water being composed of 99.99% water molecules. And so the more crystalline information and the more diverse crystalline information, I would say, that we can provide to our crystalline network, matrix network that our bodies are and that mm-hmm. our brains are, uh, the better and the more conductive and vitality we'll, we'll have. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, when I see, uh, well, I mean, I've been at concerts or parties where I see uh, a glass of beer on top of a speaker and I see like ripples in the beer, like in the liquid from from the sound that's coming out of the speaker. Right. Um, and the study of cymatics. Uh, yeah, cymatics. Yes. So water and, and liquid is very subject to, um, I guess, picking up the vibrations in the environment but i guess yeah how how do crystals uh, do crystals have a um a steady vibration that that never changes you know like the the crystal when you put it on top of a speaker at a frat party the crystal's not going to change structure you know no. it seems like the crystal is resilient in in, in its structure so um, i know the people on the podcast can't see this but mm-hmm. I, i'm showing uh Tyler, my necklace, which is made from pure silicon dioxide. Mm. So the water bottle that you referenced that I have here is glass, Mm -hmm. which is also purely silicon dioxide. If you were to chemically analyze it, it's pure silicon dioxide. Mm -hmm. The quartz crystal that we have here, the recording area that we're in, it's also um, silicon dioxide, like this one here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This here is also pure silicon dioxide, but just like uh, carbon, if we take a look at carbon, it can be in the form of graphite or it can be in the form of charcoal. Or it can be in the form of formica, which is lining your microwaves. Mm -hmm. Or it can be in the form of diamond. So when we take a look at all of these, it's purely just uh, chemically identical. They're all carbon. But just different structure. But it's the different physical structure. And so water's the same. Or Mm -hmm. in this case, it's um, uh, in the the quartz crystal, it's the same too. So when you can get quartz crystal in its densest formation, or silicon dioxide in its densest formation, it forms kind of a diamond. And... um, you're right. These types of things, what they do is they absorb all frequency and without having uh, any being changed themselves. So therefore, they're a catalyst. They absorb all the frequency and then crystals rebroadcast those frequencies in a harmonized way. Mm. So on a science term, they're going from right polarizing turning waves into left polarizing turning waves. The, the crystals are rebroadcasting frequencies. Correct. Interesting. Yeah. So, so it's not that the crystals have their own frequency. They do. Oh. They do have mm-hmm. that also because everything has its own vibratory signature. Mm-hmm. But yes. they also interact with the, the, the vibrations in the environment. Right. Mm. Exactly. So these types of, if you we would call them negative emotions, somebody screaming, you know, your neighbor upstairs, you're not mm-hmm. even hearing them, but they're really upset and they're, you know, thinking bad thoughts or maybe they're, you know, screaming at their dog because they need to outlet some anger Mm -hmm. that's ultimately affecting us in an apartment below for all of us uh, apartment dwellers here and yeah and condo dwellers in new york city Mm -hmm. um and so all that's having a huge effect so by keeping crystals around what that does is it takes the absolute value of that energy and transmutes it and and rebroadcasts it into something that will be beneficial to us Hmm. and that's part of the power of crystals the other thing is with the quartz crystal again um, our pentium processors, you know, the things that operate our electrical devices, you, have the, you, know, you have a watch on, your cell phone, your computer, they're all quartz crystal of this one specific variety because when you put some actual physical pressure on it, it releases a steady vibration or electric signal. Mm. And so be- hmm. it's called piezoelectricity. And because of this, uh, we were able to do very precise measurements. So we're able to do endless computations within our cell phones. We're able to keep time accurately forever off of quartz. That's how Mm. our GPS is able to calculate very minute changes Mm. in time in order to translate that into distance traveled. So that's why, uh, you know, on watches, it'll say like quartz. You know, Mm. I just looked down at my watch. It'll say like quartz. I always thought like there was quartz movement. 
and there was like and Japanese movement is it, some watches say like Japanese um in referring to a different kind of movement of the gears but quartz is actually the material itself matters in the function of the watch correct mm. yeah so when you put a little tiny piece of quartz and you apply some actual physical pressure on it, mm -hmm. then that squeezing of the quartz gives off a very precise vibration that does not change. Hmm. And because of the pulse of that vibration that comes out of the quartz, that's how we're able to measure time. It's super important. <sighs> yeah, I that's would how say all that's of our technology is, that's how all our technology is being run. Wow. That's how the that's how the the, pro, the the processor in your computer is run. That's how we're able to keep time. Again, that's how that's how Wi-Fi signals mm -hmm. are broadcasting. Um, it's all based off of this very rhythmic vibrational release off crystals. Mm -hmm. Wow. So if you say were to take distilled water or reverse osmosis water and put it through a um, a water structure, you know, you, you showed me this device that it's a funnel with at the bottom there's a bulb that has different kinds of quartz crystals inside of it that are um correct me if i'm wrong but they're they're polished and shaped in a certain way they have like a, a diamond shape right does, does the does the actual physical shape of the stone matter in that particular device it does yeah they're in the shape of a pyramid so mm. it's the same shape as the great as the pyramids at giza mm -hmm. um, and pyramid sites around the world that have this very specific geometry to them and so that geometry itself gives off a certain electric signal. Mm. And so those quartz crystals, what they do is they they wipe out all the frequency that would be considered negative or harmful mm. in the water, and while also providing an ionization. So it ionizes the hydrogen and the oxygen molecules. And the device that you mentioned, it's mm. uh, wrapped in 24 karat gold inside and out, mm. which is great because it keeps all outside frequencies sealed off. So it mm. can't hit the water while it's going through this process. Mm. Then, then those vials that are in there are taking the water apart into just hydrogen and oxygen. And when you have high, ionically charged hydrogen and oxygen in the correct state, it'll automatically reform itself as water. So this is the same process that goes on in a cloud. Mm -hmm. as, you have as you have ionized hydrogen or electrically charged hydrogen and oxygen, and when they come in contact close enough to each other, they always form water, and they always form water at one specific ge geometrical angle, which mm -hmm. is the angle that forms snowflakes, mm -hmm. as well as the same angle that forms all of the water in our body. So is putting distilled water through this device enough? No. So you mentioned distilled and reverse osmosis. Are those, I'm those glad are you mentioned very it. different? Yeah, because uh. those two are the types of water that are is called pure water. What you won't ever find in nature, pure water is 99.9% .9 repeating just water. Mm -hmm. And water needs to have molecules, minerals in it, electrolytes. We've all heard the uh, importance of having electrolytes in our body. Mm -hmm. uh, so magnesium, sodium, potassium being the three major ones. And so it's the same way that in, uh, an, an oyster needs to form a pearl. The only way an oyster can form a pearl is when it has a piece of sand or sediment that's stuck inside of it. Mm -hmm. And then it starts layering around it and around it and around it and starts building the structure of the pearl around that sediment. Mm -hmm. And water is the same way. If it doesn't have any sediment in it, there's no way to structure around it. Mm -hmm. So water has this really unique property called super freezing. So you can take water that's pure water, reverse osmosis or distilled water that has no sediments or no electrolytes, no minerals left in it. Mm -hmm. And you can you can cool that down with that in a motionless environment. So just stick it in a in a freezer uh, with no light. And you can super cool it down to almost zero degrees Kelvin. So just the coldest can possibly be, and it will still wow. remain in its liquid state. And it's not until it gets some type of vibration. You put a drop of salt in there, or if you f if you hit it with uh, the side of your hand, it'll instantly freeze the whole thing. Wow! Because it needs to have something catalyzing it in order to create movement. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I always recommend not using distilled or re reverse osmosis water, yeah. um, especially when you drink those directly for two reasons. Uh, the first being it's energetically dead. So, it's gone through such a heavy level of processing and we know that processed food is not good for us, but yet we drink processed water all of the time. So, number one, it's energetically dead through all the high pressure, the high heat, the UV exposure or the various ways that it's come to uh, being distilled or reverse osmosis. So, number one, it's energetically dead. Number two, there's nothing, there's no minerals or 
uh, trace elements or electrolytes in or it. Or if you just kind of squeeze some liquid trace minerals in it. Perfect. Yeah. And then, then that does well. Yeah, then you have some really awesome water. So you need to cool. remineralize the water. Because if yeah. you're drinking reverse osmosis or distilled water and you're putting it in your body, it's creating an environment that draws out the minerals yeah. from your body. Uh-huh. For, for in so order to body, create an equalization yeah. and homeostasis. Mm-hmm. So you're actually depleting the minerals in, yeah. in, in your body when you're drinking that type of water. That's why um, I think it's interesting that drinking soda, specifically like Coca-Cola or Pepsi, that's why it makes your bones weak because um, the calcium, your body, when it's, give, when it's given this acidic, horrible soda, um, it needs to find a way to buffer the acidity. Correct. So it takes calcium out of your bones yes. to balance out the the pH levels of the liquid that you just put into your body. Mm. So drinking a acidic soda actually makes your bones weaker just because your body is trying to, to compensate and try to uh, put itself into equilibrium. And I guess it's the same thing with if you drink water that has absolutely no minerals in it, your those minerals are just going to come out of other parts of your body um, to handle that water. But it's not – you don't necessarily want those minerals to leave the areas where they are um, to help process that water. Correct. Wow. Um, So I want to talk next about just – this is more – this is a bit of a tangent, but I'm interested in why water – is the liquid that is crucial to life. You know, what is it about water, H2O, that uh, is so unique that it is the thing that all life needs? No known life can live without water. Um, And I've heard some answers to this as to um, during the primordial evolution of life, um, all life kind of came from water. Uh, and it lived inside of it, it's theorized that life just needed some kind of liquid substrate to propagate itself and water is one of the only liquids that freezes from top to bottom so this allowed animals uh or just algae or or any kind of primary life form uh to live underneath the water to still have a home underneath the ice right. um while during freezing cold temperatures because fi- fish wouldn't be able to live in water if it froze bottom up right. because they would just be pushed to the top and they would die you know so there's the there's the quality of water in that it freezes top to bottom that makes it a a good candidate for life to evolve. But that's just assuming that life needs simply a liquid substrate to survive. Um, But I imagine that you might think it's deeper than that, that it's not just the fact that it's liquid, but that there's something else about water that makes it the thing that life chose, you know, or the thing that is necessary for life. Yeah, this is a great question, and it's led me into so many amazing realizations in life. Uh, where to begin? I don't know. So water is, among um, uh, many things, the, the thing that doesn't fit the physical model. So uh, it breaks the second law of thermodynamics. Um, as you mentioned, it has this weird uh, freezing property that the frozen water is less dense than the liquid water. Whereas everything else, yeah, whenever you freeze it, is more dense, and that's why the water, ice mm-hmm. comes to the top. Mm-hmm. It's because of this uh, an- anomalous physical property. So, with over seventy known physical anomalies that don't fit the physics model, why is it that we still consider water H two O when it, it's not that? So that leads us kind of down a more philosophical. So it's very unique. It's very unique. There's no other pro- type of material on this in the known universe that doesn't fit the physical model in so many ways as water. Mm -hmm. So it has all these very unique properties. So if we go to the kind of the ancient texts, you know, that are are wise elders or wisest elders, every single major religion around the world says that some entity, some consciousness came to the water and spoke to the water and then created life out of it. Hmm. 
So what you have in this case is you have vibration in the form of word or thought or intention, the act of creation, coming to water and then forming life. Uh, one of the most recent science experiments uh, has shown that whenever you take a hydrophilic surface, and this can be a very hydrophilic meaning water loving, something that mm -hmm. absorbs water. So you get a water loving hydrophilic surface and it can be very thin. It can just be two atoms thick. And you expose that to water or, uh, and then some infrared light. So infrared light would be the dawning of the, the, the planets that are exploding. And that infrared light is from our early sun would be hitting the earth. Mm -hmm. So whenever you have um, water, this hot, this water loving, water absorbing surface and infrared light, it starts creating flow along, along the side of the surface. So then there, that separates along on one side of the surface is a negatively charged and another side of the surface is a positively charged section of water. So once this hydrophilic surface starts wrapping around itself and reconnects, now you have your first cell membrane. Hmm. Excuse me. So the origin of life is coming from water, a water-loving surface and yeah. infrared light. And once it wraps around itself, now you have this this first cell membrane with a positive uh, charge and a negative charge. And that starts regulating what it's absorbing and what it's going wow. into. Wow. So what you have now is the origin of the first cell. Like the the origin of the first kind of self-governing, like semi-permeable uh, thing that has some kind of um, control over how it relates to its environment. Right. That And something that... As you said that the the um the membrane looping around to meet itself again to create the first cell that reminds me of the symbol of the Ouroboros, mm -hmm. uh, which is the snake eating its own tail. Right. Um. And I I just I I love the um the continuity between those two things. Yes. That just kind of glittered out at me, um, as interesting. Uh. So wow. So the structure of water itself or water itself is um the property of it to form in that way is crucial to cells even existing as they do. Exactly. So all cells in terms of life and as we know it on this 3D reality that we experience is all forming in water out of the necessity because of the unique properties of water. And mm -hmm. the ancient religions say that the water is the medium of all life. So it's mm -hmm. the building blocks out of which everything else is created. Yeah. So whether we go to the the, the Judeo-Christian uh, Genesis story where God came up upon the face of the waters. So at the beginning, there was God, and then there was also water, and the, and the water was void and formless. Mm -hmm. Or if you can't take a look at the Quran, and then Allah came and saw that there was water and created life. Mm -hmm. So again, we have this creator substance and water as the building block yeah and then you take a look into the vedic cycle and the veda says that everything is you know life was created and all of this was water mm. so do you think that um you know no one really knows where life came from you know there's of course the idea of panspermia where life just existed in another part of the universe and when early earth got hit with an asteroid that carried some kind of cellular life on it then it spread from there but then there is also the theory that um the primordial soup at the beginning of earth's formation once it kind of cooled enough to have liquid water on it that the chemical conditions were just right for life to spontaneously uh, exist and come into being in a way that sounds similar to how you just described it. Right. So, do you think that water, in its uh, in a in a very Goldilocks state, can just give birth to life without there having been life before? Absolutely, and they've done this in labs. Wow. they've done this in labs already. Yeah, with I, that I, hydrophilic surface. Uh huh. And you have bulk water, so just water. That, so it, it, I and in you labs expose it to you, you uh, infrared light. And then what they what they're finding is they start having self regulate the the loop will fit, that hydrophilic surface will mm -hmm. eventually close on itself seal itself off and then it starts regulating what goes in and out of the cell without any type of even nucleus or brain wow that that is directing it it just starts doing it and then the the organelles 
just would come after that maybe after 50 million years right exactly but, but that that start having these bubbles that start regulating what yeah. comes into and out of so them. it's like water creates the home that life uh, that like life inhabits. can enter into yeah wow and that's the same way that dna forms right so mm-hmm. when you have water that will be exposed to dna mm-hmm. uh, they did this experiment in 2012 by uh, this french scientist dr luc monnier uh Montagnier, and um Dr. Luc Montagnier, he took DNA and he dropped it in water. And then he took a distillation, uh, did it so many times that there could be absolutely impossible for there to be any DNA left in the mm-hmm. water that was exposed to one DNA strand. Um, and then what he did is he measured the vibration of that water, encoded it into binary, sent that binary file to an email to another lab across the world. Uh, that lab then took that binary code, converted it back into frequency and and vibrated water for a day with that frequency and then what they did is they just dropped the building blocks of dna into the water like the amino acids yeah just the amino acids so just the guanine cytosine yeah uh, those four and dropped them into the water and the water rebuilt the dna with a 99 percent accuracy Woo! Wow. So it's that. So so life is just a, a type of information that water seems to be the only thing that can carry. Exactly. And that's why our bodies <laughs> and any biological system that you take a look at is 99.9% water molecules because yeah. it is the conductive material for all information exchange. <laughs> oh so we gosh. take a look at water as just this physical substance with yeah. all of these anomalies that don't fit the physics model. Yeah. But really what it is is it is the pages of the Akashic record, if you will, or mm-hmm. it is the medium by which all consciousness expresses itself. Mm. It's, now, the, it's the Lego. It's the building yeah, blocks of life. Yeah. What do you think of, do you have any symbolic interpretation of Jesus walking on water? You uh, know, uh, it, 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 does that have any... Some... Or turning water into wine or mm-hmm. going Turn... around baptizing everyone. <laughs> yeah, what, what is that all about? What, what is your reading of the use of water um, in in the Bible? And it's any kind of potential symbolic uh, interpretation of it or symbolic meaning of it. Yeah, it's huge. So with Jesus specifically, they call him Jesus of Nazareth. Mm-hmm. But there, from his historical perspective, we cannot find any place called Nazareth. And there's no record of there being a Nazareth. And the only thing that we have is in Numbers chapter 6, verse 1, we have this concept of the Nazarene people and the creed and the type of lifestyle they would need to adapt. Mm-hmm. And the Nazarene people were the baptizers. And so John the Baptist was a Nazarene. That's why Jesus went to him to be baptized by the water. And what the water is doing when you have a Christine water with it's given with pure intention, what it's doing is it's wiping all of that negativity or all everything that from your body completely out, and it's getting pushed out into the waters, out from the out from the water within the person. So uh, when it has a baptism by water, it's what it's doing is it's taking all of that information for that was directing the person in the way that they were and putting it into another vehicle of water to allowing new water to be restored. Because when Mm -hmm. water is going through that phase change and it's never been hit by any vibration, it's just a blank page. Mm -hmm. So if we take a look at tap water, and the tap water, if we look at it as a page of information, it's just a journal filled with notes, you know, notes on Mm -hmm. top of notes on top of notes that you can't even read anymore. Yeah. And then when you structure the water, whether it's through this baptism or whether through it's a water structuring technology, whether it's glacial melt water, what you now have is a blank page of, mm-hmm. uh, that you can write anything on. Wow. That's fascinating. Um, another question I wanted to ask you is um, people always go to the beach for vacation or they want to retire on a lake house. Um, so many, so many bodies of water are so, um, prevalent in the places where people go to escape, to, to relax. And what is it about being by water that is so relaxing? Because I've noticed this in my own life, uh, the town I grew up in Marsville, as I mentioned, uh, I, there is the Delaware canal. 
So there's a, a, a man-made canal that was used in the early 1900s. Um, uh, mules would walk along the towpath and and pull barges down the water. It was just a way of um, uh, transporting goods and such. Uh, but now it's just this kind of like be- it's a state park. It's like kind of this beautiful uh, s- kind of stagnant stream. Uh, but then about you know probably a quarter of a mile away there is the Delaware River, um, and I grew up on the canal with the Delaware River like a block away, you know? Uh, So water was always very present in my life. And it always made me feel very relaxed. I would just go and and sit by the water. And I feel like sitting by the water, actually, it changed the the quality of my thought. It, It changed the way my body felt. I felt so much more relaxed. I felt like I could think with more clarity. I I would go sit by the river in order to write because I felt like I could write better when I was sitting next to the river. You know, Um, what is that all about? Why do people seek out water for so many of these kind of recreational and revitalizing purposes? Not, Not to drink it, but to just be next to it? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, There's actually a book recently written on this. It's called Blue Mind Mm. and by Wallace J. Nichols. And it's all about the science of relaxation and why we move to water and why it is so relaxing and all the studies that are out there. And you make some implications that uh, some I agree with, some I don't. But um, then I... Going back further in the 1890s, there was this Austrian forester. Uh, his name was Victor Schauberger, and he was known as the original water wizard. And he was uh, during the time of Nikolai Tesla, and he and Tesla were contemporaries. And he has just as many amazing scientific discoveries and patents to his name regarding water. And what he would do is he would sit by a stream of water in the forest, and he would meditate. And what he realized is what he could do is take his consciousness, which is no more than the water moving in his own body, and give it to the to the river. So his consciousness would become that of the moving water of the river. And there's some ancient Japanese people as well, texts of people sitting next to waterfalls and doing this very same thing. And then when they come back into their body after the meditation, that all the secrets that are contained within the water are revealed to them. And this is how Victor Schauberger came up with all his uh, fascinating discoveries. He wrote a lot of books and uh, has a lot of beautiful patents that are still being used today. And it's all come from this consciousness. And so where it's coming from is your body, by uh, your brain specifically, by weight is 93% water. Mm -hmm. And as we know in our modern society, we're way too caught up with our our prefrontal cortex thinking, our... Mm -hmm. Ah, this happened to me in the past, and what about the future, and what if, and oh man, that happened. And so Who am I? Yeah, we have this endless cluster of thoughts, so whenever we go out to a body of water, the water has this beautiful property. So if we were to take your water bottle and my water bottle, and we would test them independently, they would have a different structure and energetic properties. Mm -hmm. Then, if we were to set them next to each other for a period of about 15 minutes, that's it. And we set them next to each other, and then we chemically analyze them or physically analyze them and take a look at the structure of the water or the um, energetics of the water. They'll become identical. Is that why people cheers their glasses before they drink? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Wow. And that's why, you know, you, when you start feeling weird on the subway and want to move to a different part of the subway because somebody's just, you know, th- their water isn't quite aligned with yours. Wow. So someone's water content of their body is the source of their vibe. Right. <laughs> it is their vibe. That's the exact thing that <laughs> gives so off a vibe. That's so mind-blowing. Is, is the water structure and the energetics of collectively of all the water molecules is a person's vibration. And therefore, the vibe and aura they're giving off. So, so whenever they're sitting next to the water, mm-hmm. we have our big vibe mm-hmm. here. And so we're just this little drop in the recode of the vast ocean. So what we feel is an energetic release because we're all wound up. Mm-hmm. You know, we have all these thoughts. We have all these pressures. We all have all this food overload. We have this job overload. We have these you know, things that we want to do in our life or have done that we want to get rid of. 
And so because of the water being a larger volume of water than our bodies, it takes all of that negative or things that we want to no longer have, and it just gets absorbed into the larger body of water. Mm. Wow. So Because of that property of water sharing information just due to local proximity with itself in a quantum manner. Mm. So whenever you're having stress and you go sit by the beach, the movement of the beach is a much larger volume and a larger energy body than you are. It just overwhelms you in a way. Exactly. So you become it. And does the ocean have any worries? No way. No way. Wow. So So you you absorb one with the vibration of the ocean when you're next, when you're at the beach. Yeah. And the longer you're there, the more you become one with it. That's why people who live that beach life are so laid back and just relaxed because they have they don't have all that stress because they are the ocean's vibration i feel like people who live by rivers they're always canoeing or kayaking right or or, or doing something i feel like when i think of someone who lives by the beach i think of someone who's chilling in a hammock right (laughs) just riding the waves (laughs) just riding the just riding the waves when i think about someone living by a river it seems to be more of an active relaxation Mm -hmm. to be by to be by a river um, or the people who live in the mountain lakes, they tend to be very deep and serene, just like the water that yeah. they're around. Because wow. they're absorbing the frequency of whatever the largest volume of water is. I live next to the East River in New York City. Uh, what do you think the vibration of that spot is? Uh, how, how, how are the rivers doing? What about the fast, Hudson? Fast-paced, chaotic, and cold. <laughs> yeah, like New York City. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Dude, I think that's a good place to, to wrap it up. Excellent. Dude, thank you so much. That was so mind-blowing. Um, I, I came into this conversation only having like just some curiosities uh, without having any kind of uh, inklings into what the answers to my questions might even be. I just had questions, but... You you totally blew my mind with what you said, and this is going to be a podcast that I'm going to have to like listen over four or five times just to like redigest all that information. I I think so differently about water now. I think differently about crystals. I think differently about how I'm going to continue my life and how I'm going to integrate water into it. And th- thanks a lot for doing this, man. I, I really this appreciate my it. Pleasure. Yeah. All right, and with that, the iceberg has been lifted. Thank you again for listening to the Lifting the Iceberg podcast. You can find out more about James and his company at BeLifeWater.com and at BeLifeWater on Instagram. Thank you to Alexis Batty for designing the graphics for this podcast. You can find her at AlexisBatty.com. And thank you to Kurusu for the soundtrack, Stay With Me. You can find Caruso on Spotify, YouTube, and SoundCloud. You can stay up to date on any new podcasts at LiftingTheIceberg.com or by following Lifting the Iceberg on Facebook and Instagram. 